<laughs> do, you, do you hear that, uh, Amy? Uh, 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 Betty said, out of town and possibly divorced. <laughs> well, let's hope not. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> All right, well, we're in a real conundrum this morning. Because uh, in my haste to print off notes uh, before uh, I uh, came to class, um, I printed off chapter 10. Well, the only problem is we're in chapter 12. <laughs> so I'm going to have to wing this class today without my notes. And so uh, hopefully uh, I can uh, do it justice. And so, but if it's a bit lacking, uh, it's because I didn't have my support with me. Uh, fortunately, the Bible says to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so I did spend quite a bit of time studying for this chapter this week, so hopefully I can remember the things uh, uh, that I put in the notes. All right, so Revelation chapter 12. Now, what happened in chapter 11 when we left off last time? Well, in chapter 11, we completed our second trip through the tribulation. Um, as we've told you on several occasions, um, Revelation does not chronologically give us the seals, the trumpets, and the vials, but each one of those is a particular telling of the tribulation period. Uh, there's uh, four uh, stories of the tribulation, or four accounts, uh, in the book of Revelation, and as we told you before, that matches the four Gospels. The four Gospels give you four different views of the first coming of Christ. Revelation gives you four different views of the second coming of Christ. And so, chapter 11 completed our second trip through the tribulation. Uh, in verse uh, 15, the seventh uh, angel sounded, and uh, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. That's the second advent. And then, uh, in verse uh, 17, we saw the Bible skip a thousand years ahead into the future and show us the end of the millennium and the white throne judgment. And then it went right back in verse 19 and showed us the temple of God where the ark uh, of His testament was seen. And so uh, that's where we left off last time. So chapter 12, verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And so uh, the first thing we see uh, that's uh, introduced uh, is this woman. Now, of course, uh, the Bible here does not specify uh, who this woman is, and so we have to uh, do a little digging to figure this out. And so uh, uh, many commentaries uh, will tell you that this is the church, um, that the woman is representative of the church. The church, of course, is referred to as the bride of Christ and the wife of the Lamb. And so uh, some would say that this is the church. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church in particular would tell you that this is the Roman Catholic Church. But nevertheless, um, as we shall see, uh, this is not a church of any sort. Uh, this woman is representative of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel. Notice what we're told about this woman in verse 1. It says that this woman was clothed with the sun and the moon, and under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Now, any time you see the number 12, the first thing that pops into your mind is the nation of Israel because there were 12 sons of Jacob. Jacob is Israel. And those 12 sons became 12 tribes. And from those 12 tribes, we got the nation of Israel. So any time we see the number 12, um, you know, uh, that makes us start thinking about Israel. But there's more than just that. Uh, notice it says that this woman was clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet. Now take your Bibles for a moment and come to Genesis chapter 37. Genesis chapter 37. Now in Genesis chapter 37, we're introduced to a young man by the name of Joseph. And um, you may recall that I've taught you previously that Joseph is perhaps the greatest type of Christ in the entire Bible. And um, if you study the life of Joseph, you'll find that um, he is a type of Christ in 152 different particulars. And so uh, uh, we definitely don't have time to discuss that uh, this morning because we got off to a bit of a late start. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, we should uh, understand the fact that Joseph is a tremendous type of Christ. Now come to, if you will, uh, to verse 5. Genesis 37, verse 5. 
And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren. And they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheaf arose, and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about, and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. Now bear in mind the reason why they've got this attitude is two reasons. One, he's the youngest, and so it's offensive to them to think that the youngest brother would have dominion over all the rest. And then also, uh, because uh, 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 if you look back at uh, verse 3, now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. You see, Jacob made the mistake that a lot of parents make as far as showing favoritism to one child over another. That is always going to lead to trouble. And so that's why they hated him so much. Now, uh, look, if you will, verse 9. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more, and behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. Now, what's 11 plus 1? 12. So the 11 stars are Joseph's 11 brothers, and Joseph is that 12th star. And so, uh, look verse 10. And he told it to his father, Jacob, or Israel, and to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed to come come to bow down ourselves to thee, to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. And so notice uh, Joseph's dream. You got the sun, you got the moon, and you got the 12 stars. And so when we come back to uh, Revelation chapter 12, and by the way, this is not Revelation chapter 11, and it's not Revelation chapter 13, it's Revelation chapter 12. Now, of course, all the scholars will tell you that in the original autographs uh, that there were no verse numbers, no chapter uh, numbers, and so forth. Um, of course, they say that having never laid eyes on the original manuscripts. You understand that, right? Now, nobody that's alive today has ever seen the original manuscripts. And so I kind of chuckle uh, when folks dogmatically talk about what was in the original and what wasn't because nobody that's alive today has ever seen the original. Every manuscript that exists on this earth, Greek or Hebrew, Aramaic or anything else, is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy, probably hundreds of copies going back to the originals. And so uh, when someone speaks with authority about the original, uh, take that with a grain of salt, because they may or may not know what they're talking about. Now don't get me wrong, um, I believe in, in, in the divine inspiration of the original autographs as they were penned by the writers under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost of God. But in addition to that, I believe in the divine preservation of the Scriptures that what God inspired, He has also preserved, and what I hold in my hands right now has the very same authority as the original autographs themselves. And if this was the original, and this is my King James Bible, do you know which one I would teach to you from this, mor uh, this morning? My King James Bible. You know why? Because I know English better than I know Greek or Hebrew. <laughs> and so uh, I have confidence that what God wants us to know is available for us today, and we can read it, and we can study it, we can memorize it, we can meditate on it, we can share it with others, and hopefully by the grace of God, we try to live it. And so, uh, I don't think that it's an accident that this is chapter 12. I think that God took a whole chapter to talk about the nation of Israel here in the book of Revelation, and if he was going to choose any chapter to do that, it'd be chapter 12. And so, uh, this woman is clothed with the sun, the moon, uh, and, her, uh, and her, under her feet are these uh, 12 stars, or this crown with 12 stars. And so, verse 2, and she being with child, this woman is pregnant, cried, travailing in birth, 
and pained to be delivered. And so, um, I, you know, since I didn't bring my notes, I don't have the references, uh, but there are several references uh, in the Old Testament. I'm thinking of Jeremiah, where the nation of Israel is spoken of as being in travail and bringing forth a child in a day. And so uh, uh, the nation of Israel is spoken of in, in that metaphor of being a woman with child in travail. And so uh, it says that she pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, uh, there's no doubt about who this dragon is. Um, if you look down at verse 9, uh, the Bible very plainly tells us. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now we'll have more to say about verse 9 in just a moment, but I wanted you to see that in verse 3, we already know who this red dragon is. And so notice it says that he has seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. Now, that's going to become important when we look at chapter 13 and we look at chapter 17. And so since we're pressed for time right now, uh, since we got off to a late start, I'm not going to say too much about the seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns, because I'm going to have a lot to say about that uh, in chapter 17, and I'm going to have somewhat to say about it in chapter 13. And so, um, verse 4, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon it was, as it was born. Um, now the question arises, is verse 4 in the past, or is verse 4 in the future? And honestly, to tell you the truth, I think you could argue it either way. I think you could put verse 4 in the past, as far as the fall of Satan, um, but I also see where you could put it in the future as far as a future battle. The reason why I say that is uh, look at verse 7. Verse 7 says, There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. Now, verse 7 and 8, I believe to be future. And so because verse 7 and 8 is most likely future, then that means that verse 4 possibly is future as well. However, we do know that in the past, Satan fell. And when he fell, angels, we don't know how many, followed him and became demons or devils. And so, verse 4 could be referring to that, and if it is, then that means a third of the angels that God created at the beginning fell with Lucifer and rebelled when he rebelled. If it's future, think about this. That means a third of the angels that are in heaven right now are going to rebel in the future during the tribulation. <coughs> and so, um, if you read commentaries, if you read uh, what the so-called scholars say, uh, you'll get varying opinions about what this refers to. I tend to take um, verse 4 as being in the past. And then I take verse 7 and 8 to be in the future. Now, I could be completely wrong about that, so I, I freely uh, 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 leave it to you to be persuaded in your own mind um, as far as uh, uh, how you take those passages. Uh, but that's how I take them. Now, of course, the fall of, uh, of Satan is, is chronicled in Isaiah chapter 14. Come over to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. And then we're going to look at Ezekiel 28. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. In Isaiah 14, come to verse uh, 12, I believe. Yes, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Now I want you to notice uh, the use of the word Lucifer. Um. In all the modern translations, that has been changed. Um, I have a footnote. Uh, this is a, a Bible published by Thomas Nelson. And so Thomas Nelson has the copyright on the New King James. And so uh, uh, Thomas Nelson here 
uh, puts a footnote that says literally day star. In other words, it can be translated day star. Um, in the NIV, the NIV calls it the morning star. The morning star. Well, there's only one problem with that. In Revelation 22, verse 16, Jesus Christ says that He is the bright and morning star. So if you make uh, 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 Lucifer here the morning star, you're creating confusion as far as who fell, who rebelled against God, Lucifer or Jesus. <laughs> and so uh, the King James Bible has it right. This is Lucifer. Uh, listen, uh, even people in this world who are not Christians, who do not go to church and do not read the Bible, if you ask them who Lucifer is, what are they going to say? They're going to say the devil. And so Lucifer is synonymous with the devil. Lucifer was his name before he fell. Uh, and Lucifer means light bearer. It comes from the Latin lux ferro. And watch this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Paul says, For no marvel, for even Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. An angel of light. Why? Because he's Lucifer, Lux Pharaoh. He's the light bearer. And when you think of light, you think of good. When you think of dark, you think of evil. And so he is an angel of light. Why? For the purpose of deception. Because he copycats and counterfeits and does everything he can to make you think that you've got a genuine Rolex watch when all you've got is a $10 fake from off the streets. And so, uh, he is the light bearer. So, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Five times, Lucifer says, I, I, I. What's important about that? Well, what's the middle letter of pride? I. Uh, what did Paul say was the condemnation of the devil? In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7, he said, Not a novice, as far as a pastor, not a new, new believer, not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. What was the condemnation of the devil? His pride. His pride. Um, notice um, it says, verse 15, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, and that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Now notice verse 16 says, Is this the man? Is this the man? Is Lucifer a man? No, he's not. Lucifer is a cherub. He's the anointed cherub. He's not an angel. Notice Paul said that he is transformed, transformed into an angel of light. Uh, my son went to boot camp at Paris Island. He went in as a civilian and the Marine Corps transformed him into a Marine. But he wasn't a Marine when he first showed up on the yellow footprints. And so, transformation means that whatever you are now, you were not that before. So if Satan is transformed into an angel of light, then he wasn't an angel before that. What was he? A cherub. And we'll get to that in just a second. Now, let me ask this. How is Lucifer spoken to as a man? Well, let me ask you this. How is God spoken of as a man? in the person of Jesus Christ. Colossians 2.9 Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, 1 Timothy 3.16 God was manifest in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And so, how, did, how can God be spoken of as a man? In the person of Jesus Christ. Alright? How then can the devil be spoken of as a man? In the person of the Antichrist. Because when you look at verse 
17 that made the world a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof and that opened not the house of the prisoners. Even verse 16 that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms. That's talking about the Antichrist. That's talking about the tribulation. So there is a dual application going on here because the Antichrist is going, verse uh, uh, 14 and 15, the Antichrist is going to sit on the throne of God in the temple of God in Jerusalem and proclaim himself that he's God. In essence, in his heart, he's saying, I will sit upon this mount of the congregation. I will exalt my throne. I will ascend above the heights and all that. I will be like the Most High. But yet, he's going to be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And so, this has a dual application to the fall of Satan way back at the beginning and also what's going to happen in the future as far as the Antichrist during the tribulation. And so, you'll find that oftentimes in the Bible, um, there are dual applications. Remember the passage in Matthew that says, the people that walked in darkness, they saw great light. You know, uh, that's a quotation from the prophets. Well, Matthew takes that and applies that to the first coming of Jesus Christ. Do you know what the context is of what the, what the prophet actually said in the Old Testament? The second coming of Christ. And so, uh, sometimes verses in the Bible have dual application. Um, Jesus, in the synagogue in Luke 4, uh, he goes in and he reads Isaiah chapter 61. But he stops at the part in Isaiah 61 where the context changes from the first coming to the second coming. Why? The passage has a dual application to both advents. <laughs> and so, uh, the Bible is a marvelous book, folks. It's a marvelous book. And so, uh, let's look over to Ezekiel chapter 28. Because uh, Paul and Betty called me up this week. Paul couldn't wait till Sunday. He had to call me during the week. Actually, Betty called me, so I'm not going to blame Paul for this one. But Ezekiel chapter 28, look at this. Ezekiel chapter 28, look at verse 1. The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat of God, in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God, though thou set thine heart as the heart of God. Who's that sound like? Sounds just like the devil, doesn't it? Here's the thing, though. Who's this king of Tyrus? Well, here's the thing. The king of Tyrus was a pagan Gentile king, a wicked, wicked man. So God, when he wants to address the devil and say some things to the devil, he takes this king of Tyrus who's puffed up like a bullfrog, just like the devil is, and he speaks to the devil through the similitude of this king of Tyrus. And so although we read the king of Tyrus, don't misunderstand who he's talking to. Look at verse 3. Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that they can hide from thee. Now what human being is wiser than Daniel except for maybe Solomon? The Bible says that Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived outside the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, Daniel's right up there with him. So what human being is going to be wiser than Daniel? None. Um. With, wis with thy wisdom and thine understanding, thou hast gotten the riches and hast gotten gold and silver into thy treasures. Now that's certainly addressing the human king of Tyrus. By thy great wisdom and by thy traffic hast thou increased thy riches and thine heart is lifted up because of thy riches. So, so this is a very proud individual. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast set thine heart as the heart of God, behold therefore I will bring strangers upon thee, and the terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of thy wisdom, and they shall defile thy brightness. Thy brightness? Hello, Lux Pharaoh. Hello, Lucifer. Hello, light bearer. They shall bring thee down to the pit. Oh, that sounds like Isaiah chapter 12, doesn't it? And thou shalt die the deaths of them that are slain in the midst of the sea. Wilt thou yet say before him that slayeth thee, I am God? But thou shalt be a man, Antichrist, and no God in the hand of him that slayeth thee. Thou shalt die the deaths of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers, for I have spoken it, saith the Lord God. And so, humanly speaking, this is addressing this king of Tyrus, who is a very proud, arrogant individual against God. 
But above and beyond that, God's addressing Lucifer. Now look at verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, uh, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, Thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, and perfect in beauty. Perfect in beauty. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Oh, now let's stop right there for a second. Who is in the garden of God? Start naming the names. Adam, Eve, who else? The serpent. God. Anybody else? I mean, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, that's where the garden is talked about. Was there anybody else in the garden besides God, the serpent, Adam, and Eve? Well, when they got uh, banished, God put an angel at the gate to make sure they didn't come back in. But in the garden itself, there was only those four individuals. So, when verse 13 says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, well, we know it's not God, because God's the one that's speaking. We know it's not Adam, and we know it's not Eve, because when this is being written, they've been dead for thousands of years. There's only one possibility of who verse 13 is talking to. The devil. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold. The workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. What's tabrets? Like a tambourine. What's pipes? a musical instrument, like a flute, uh, like an organ, and so a pipe music or, or instrument. So notice it says, the, thy tabrets and thy pipes were prepared in thee. In thee. So they were part of his being. And that's why God says, verse 12, that he was full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Lucifer was the most perfect creation that God had ever made and by far the most beautiful. And listen, in Job 38, when it talks about the creation of the earth and the Bible says that the morning, or it says that the sons of God, which were the angels, that the sons of God sang for joy, who do you think was their worship leader? I'll tell you who their worship leader was. This fellow right here who had tabrets, and pipes as part of his person. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. And, and Satan's up there. The tabrets are being tapped. The pipe is blowing. And he's got the perfect 4-4 four, four time. As he leads the sons of God singing the glory of God. That's why music is a dangerous thing because music can be corrupted to influence you in a bad way. What did Eric talk about this morning at the beginning of his sermon? Talked about all those love songs. Alright, so watch this. I'm not saying that Eric was guilty of this, but you know why most young men have mixtapes to play love songs for their girlfriends, don't you? Sure you do. They're trying to fornicate with them. Oh yeah! Nothing will get a young lady in the mood like a romantic song because young ladies crave love and that song helps them think that that young boy loves them. Young boys don't care much about love. They care about sex. And so it's aptly been said 
that women use sex to get love and men use love to get sex. And one of the chiefest ways you know that's true is music. Because everybody knows that you put on that romantic jazz or you play that love song to, to set the mood. And so uh, uh, we're going to at least make out and we'll see where it goes from there. See? That's how it is. Hey, uh, uh, I, I was born at night, but it wasn't last night. I mean, I know I look, I look like I fell off a load of pumpkins, but I didn't, you know? And so listen here, the flesh is the flesh. And so, um, you know, uh, music is dangerous. Uh, listen, you go to a restaurant at lunchtime, they're going to play a fast-paced song. You know why? Because people have limited time for lunch, and the music at a fast pace causes you to eat faster. It's physiologically documented. You go back to that same restaurant that night and they'll be playing much slower music. You know why? Because at dinner time, people are more relaxed and they're not in a hurry because the work day is over and now they're ready to relax for the evening and they don't mind if supper takes a little bit longer than lunch did. Oh yeah, music. How does it affect the church? Well, some churches, you walk in the door, uh, you get confused about whether you're in a rock concert or, or whether you're, you're in a worship service. You know, uh, whatever happened to the old hymns? Uh, uh, the one I just sang. Man, why, why can't we sing things like that? Well, you know, uh, uh, I'm not speaking so much about First Norfolk, so let me you know, be clear here. Because we do sing hymns here. Uh, uh, matter of fact, uh, it as well. That, that, uh, it was to a different arrangement today, uh, but, but it was, uh, uh, that's, that's an old hymn. I'm talking about where you walk in and it's so dark you wonder if you're in a nightclub. Uh, there's multicolored strobe lights up on the stage. You know, uh, smoke, you know, uh, uh, all over the place or, 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 or steamed. It just like there's a, like a haze, like a bunch of uh, dope heads have been smoking pot for hours and hours. Uh, and, uh, and, the, and the music is so over the top, fleshly, that you come out of there feeling defiled instead of edified. Listen, I go to church to worship God, not to be entertained in the flesh. And what's going on today is that we're more concerned about having large congregations, and as a result, we end up entertaining goats instead of feeding sheep. I got news for you. God didn't call me to feed goats, or entertain goats, excuse me. He called me to feed sheep. And that's why what you'll find is this. Bible-believing churches that worship God in spirit and in truth, usually, there are exceptions, usually they are small congregations. You know why? Because people don't like to hear the truth, and when they do go to church, they want to be entertained. And if you're going to tell the truth about their sin, in particular, and then not entertain them with fleshly music that they like, they're going to go somewhere else, and they're going to find a different church that will do, uh, do it the way they want it. It's like Burger King. Have it your way. And since we have a church on practically every corner, you know, not only in Hampton Roads, but across the country, uh, people have that option. Listen, uh, if people don't like what I'm saying, don't worry. They can go down the street and they'll find somebody else that will tell them what they want to hear. Uh, the, the Bible says, For the time shall come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. In other words, uh, uh, my ear is itching. I need a scratch. Tell me what I want to hear. Joel Olstein, your best life now. You know? Uh, uh, if this is my best life now, God help me. If this is all, listen, if this is the best I've got to look forward to, I'm in a mess, and so are you. Uh, listen, this ain't my best life now. My best life now is when the clouds open up, the angel sounds out, the Lord says, Come up hither, and I get out of here. That's my best life now. That's right. Uh, my best life now is walking a street of pure gold. Uh, my best life now is drinking from the river of life that proceeds out from the throne of God. Uh, my best life now is living in a mansion that God has prepared. That's my best life now. If, if this is your best life now, you need to get saved. Because if this is your best life now, that means you're going to hell. You're not saved. You're lost. If this is your best life now. So maybe someone ought to pray for old Joel to get born again. 
Because if Joel got born again, he might stop preaching that nonsense and he might start preaching the Bible instead. Uh, you say, uh, you shouldn't uh, uh, name names. Why not? God names names. Jesus called Herod a fox. Paul said the Cretans were evil beasts, slow bellies, and liars. Wow. Uh, John the Baptist looked at the Pharisees and said, Ye generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? How shall ye escape the damnation of hell? Let me tell you something. John the Baptist wouldn't be invited to many Southern Baptist churches today. And he's John the Baptist. <laughs> uh, the Apostle Paul, if Paul sent his resume to every Southern Baptist church in this country and didn't put his name on it, there's not a Southern Baptist church in this country that would hire Paul to be their pastor. You know why? They'd look at his arrest record and say, we don't want that fellow being our pastor. He's too radical. And yet he wrote most of the New Testament that we read. <laughs> but he's too radical. John was too radical too. They cut his head off. You know, Paul was martyred. Jesus, obviously, he was crucified. And so that's why the Bible says, Marvel not if the world hate you. Know that it hated me before it hated you. Now look at this. We're taking up all of our time. What time is it? All right, I'm going to stop here in a few minutes. Obviously, we're not going to finish the chapter today. But we, we, we really need to nail down the devil here. Look at verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked holy mountain of God. Holy mountain of God? That's in heaven, folks. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day thou was what? Created, not born. Do you see that? This isn't the king of Tyrus anymore. Because the king of Tyrus wasn't created. He was born. But in verse 15, this fellow was created and he's a cherub, and he covered the throne of God, and he walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire, and he was on the holy mountain of God, the holy Zion that's in heaven. Yeah. Thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created, till iniquity was found in thee. And so, uh, look at, for sake of time, uh, well, no, I've I got to read this, I'm sorry. Uh, thou was perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Look at verse 17. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Satan got too full of himself. And thou hast uh, corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Now notice, thou art the anointed cherub. All right. What did you, uh, uh, Jews refer to as their, their coming Savior? Starts with an M. Messiah. All right. So in Hebrew, we have Messiah. You ever hear someone say, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. All right? So in the Old Testament, the term is Messiah. In the New Testament, the word is Christ. And so uh, in Greek, uh, Christos. So both of these words are basically the same word because both of them mean Anointed. Yeah, we're, st we're, we're still in Ezekiel. Yeah. Uh, 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 chapter 28, verse 14. Yeah. So he says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So by saying that he's anointed, it's saying that he is a Christ. He is a Messiah. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Covereth what? The throne of God. Because as the most beautiful creation that God ever made that was in charge of worship, Lucifer was privileged 
to cover the throne of God and manifest the beauty in Him that God had created Him to be. But there came a point where Lucifer wasn't satisfied anymore to play second fiddle. And that's when he said in his heart, I will be like the Most High. God anointed him. Remember, uh, who anointed David? Samuel the prophet. Samuel put oil on him and, 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 and anointed him, right? And he was anointed as the king of Israel. And so, uh, God created Lucifer and God anointed Lucifer uh, as the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. Got too big for his britches. That's exactly right. Now, what is a cherub? Take your Bible and come back to Ezekiel chapter 1. And this is where we'll close. I'm going to show you what a cherub is and we're done. Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, let's see. Look at verse 5. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man... And every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces in their wings. And they were joined one to another, they turned not when they went, and they went every one straight forward. As for the likenesses of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion and the, uh, 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 on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. So uh, notice that there's four of them. Um, they've got four faces. They've got four wings. The top torso uh, is like a, a man. Uh, the bottom torso is like a calf. You ever heard anyone refer to the devil as old split foot? Folks used to refer to Satan as old split foot, probably not even knowing where it came from because verse 7 says the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot. A calf's foot is split. And so that's why people used to call the devil old split foot. Yeah, no, no <laughs> doubt. So uh, notice that these living creatures, though, that there's four of them. Evidently, though, there used to be five of them. Now look over at uh, Ezekiel 10 and we're done. Ezekiel 10. So verse 2 says, And he spake unto the man clothed with linen, and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the cherub, and fill thine hand with coals of fire from between the cherubims, and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And so uh, we see uh, uh, the, the cherubim uh, spoken of again. Now come down for sake of time uh, to verse 8. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings. Matches chapter 1. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubs, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheel was as the color of a barrel stone. And as for their appearance, they four had one likeness, as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place whither the head uh, looked, they followed it. They turned not as they went. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and the wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that the four had. Now look at verse uh, 14. And every one had four faces, the first face was the face of a cherub, and the second face was the face of an ox, and the third face uh, was the face of a lion, and the fourth face, the face of an eagle. And so, um, notice what's different from chapter 1. Because here it says, a cherub, a man, a lion, and an eagle. A cherub, a man, a lion, and an eagle. What did chapter 1 say? Chapter 1 said, an ox, a man, um, a lion, and an eagle. So what do we learn from that? That the face of a cherub is the face of an ox. 
when the children of Israel came up out of uh, Egypt and sinned against God and made an idol, what did they make? A golden calf. Who put it in Aaron's heart to make a calf? Old split foot. That's right. Throughout the Old Testament, what was the pr uh, 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 predominant opposing religion? Baal worship. Calf worship. God's got His religion. The devil's got His. God's got His prophets. The devil has His. Mark my words. If God has a book, the devil will have His. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, a cherub is not an angel. A cherub is a living creature. Um, it has four faces. It has four wings. The top half of a man, the bottom half of a calf. According to God, it's beautiful. I agree with you. It sounds terrifying. <laughs> but maybe if you, when we see it in heaven, maybe we'll think it's beautiful too with our glorified eyeballs and our glorified bodies. No, no. The, the, cherub, the cherubim are still there in heaven uh, today. And so are the seraphim. And so um, uh, that gives us some insight to that old dragon, uh, that old serpent, uh, the, the devil. Um, and so uh, we're going to have to stop right there. Uh, I've been trying to go a chapter a week, uh, and we've been keeping up a pretty good pace uh, you know, with that. Uh, but today, uh, uh, with Dr. Newman coming in, we, we lost a little bit of time, and so uh, I apologize for that. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it was uh, uh, great for you guys to hear about the school, and uh, we're going to be able to uh, uh, hopefully uh, finish the chapter next week well, actually, uh, I, another, uh, I, that's my announcement uh, uh, that uh, Becky asked for. I'm not here next week. I'll be at a Bible conference in Florida. Uh, and so uh, we will not be having class at all, either in person or by Zoom. We will resume class the following week, uh, the 21st. And I'll make sure that that goes out in the email. Okay? All right, so we're going to take a break uh, right there. And so uh, we'll pick up uh, with Revelation chapter 12 uh, next time because when we left off... Uh, that old serpent, that dragon, that uh, devil, uh, he's standing there waiting to devour the woman's child as soon as the child is born. Now the question is, who is that child? And so we're going to find out next week who that child is. And so uh, uh, that'll be an interesting study uh, in of itself. All right, so uh, that's where we'll stop. Uh, any questions today?